what you're doing, the, the fasting prayer, just studying the book of Romans. Uh, and I just think that's, that's so beautiful. And, and it's amazing how God does things, amen? Because this is actually a portion of scripture that I was studying. We were talk, we've been talking in our youth group. We've been talking about the Holy Spirit. We've been talking about this. We've been talking about worship. And what's crazy is even, uh, what is today? Today is Friday. Wednesday, I had a friend that uh, just randomly flew into Oklahoma. He's from Ohio, and he flew in here um, just for a day. He was here on a work visit, and we got to spend the evening together, and, and I was talking to him and just sharing my heart and hearing what he has, what's going on with him, and there's not a whole lot of churches where he is in Ohio, and so they essentially, um, they're just kind of like a house church, probably like how this church probably once started, or all our churches once started, that's kind of how they're meeting right now, and they've been talking through the book of Romans, and they've been talking about this, and talking through Romans chapter 12, and, and it's amazing how uh, what we might think might be a unique idea to just one or two or a few of us, it's amazing to see how the Holy Spirit is really working, amen, that the Holy Spirit was working from Oklahoma all the way to Ohio, that there's some there's a church over there that's going through the same, same portion of Scripture, studying the same thing at the same time. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Um, once again, I just want to say, praise God. I'm glad to be here. Um, I, I don't know what's going on with the first few rows. Uh, I was sitting in one of them, and so if there's something I should know about them, let me know. If I need to take an extra shower or something when I go home, because, huh? Six pews? Yeah, um, I, don't know. I don't know what it is. I, I remember growing up, that's something that uh, every preacher that would come in would say was, uh, there's a special anointing in the front. I, I went and sat there in the front. That anointing was, uh, it, was, uh, it was their special anointing. Amen? Uh, praise God. Uh, this evening, we're uh, going to the book of Romans, chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles, let's all turn there. Are there any office fans here? A few of them? I'm, I'm looking that direction because I know there's one or two there. Um, while everyone's turning to Romans chapter 12, uh, I know this is a very deep, deep portion of scripture, but I just have something for you guys that I was thinking. Uh, Romans chapter 12, this first verse is so deep, it's so powerful. There's, you, can make a script, you can make a message out of pretty much every word in here. And what I was imagining was Paul in the words of uh, uh, Kevin saying, why use lot word when few word do trick? I feel like that's what he was thinking when he wrote verse 1 and 2. Anyways, let's, uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Uh, I'm, I'm going to read verse 1 and 2, but today I'll, I'm going to try to just focus on verse 1. Therefore, does everyone have it? Amen. All right. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing, sorry, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your rational act of worship. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to read from the NIV as well. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Verse 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the, by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Amen? If we could all close our eyes for just a second. Heavenly Father, once again we come to you, and I, I, I submit myself before you once again. I thank you that... Um, You've, you've chosen to use me this evening, and I pray that every word that comes out of my mouth won't be my own, but it will be yours. For my words will fall flat to the ground, but we know that what you speak, what you send from your mouth, your word that comes forth, it will not return to you void. It will not return to you until it has done everything you have sent it to do. I pray that our hearts are ready to receive your word. 
We give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I know that you all have been studying this for the last couple of days, so uh, I might touch on some of the same things you've heard already, and that's okay. That's, that's totally okay. Um, it, I believe that if we hear something and we hear it again and again, there's a reason for that. There was a preacher that went to a, a city to preach. He was a three-day revival. Some of you might have heard the story. Went the first day, <laughs> preached this powerful message, powerful message, and uh, uh, everybody was so excited, you know, they all came. Uh, he was the kind of preacher that you wanted to call to your house to have a special prayer for your special child so that he would give a special word, then you can give a special handshake after. He was that kind of preacher. It's so powerful. And then the second day, they called all their friends and they came back and he went up to preach and he preached the exact same message, word for word. And everyone's a little bit confused and they're like, he, they said, okay, maybe the third day we'll see, maybe something else. The third day they came, and they, he preached, preached a powerful message again, but it was the exact same message. And finally, some of the bolder church members went up to him. Um, bolder sometimes also equates to older. So the bolder church members went up to him and said, preacher, you preached such a powerful message the first day, and then you repeated the second and the third day. And he said, yeah, the reason I did that is because I preached it the first day, and then I didn't see any change after that. So I preached it the second, I still didn't see any change. I preached it the third, I still didn't see any. So I believe that sometimes the Holy Spirit will just keep speaking and speaking because the Holy Spirit is trying to get us to see what he has written. Amen? Amen. So don't fret if you've already heard the message. Don't fret if you've already heard this over this, the course of this week during your fasting prayer. In fact, I praise God for that. Amen? So the first right off, right when we're starting this, we see something. We see when Paul is writing this letter or writing this, he writes, starts off by saying, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters. No one ever starts a portion of anything with the word therefore, right? And so when, the word, when it starts off with therefore, you always have to ask the question, what is it there for, right? And so when you look at why this portion is even here, why Paul even starts to write this, he starts writing, therefore, so that means we have to look at what's behind it, right? So if we look behind it in Romans chapter 11 and verses 33 through 36, we read the therefore that Paul is talking about. And it says, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who or who has been his counselor? I believe that's in Isaiah that he's quoting. And then he quotes Job, who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Therefore, see what Paul is doing here is when he's writing this letter, when he's writing this portion, he's, what he's doing is he's talking about the goodness and the greatness of God. The majesty of God. And he's doing all of this because he's about to say something else. Amen? He's about to say something else. And so whatever Paul is about to say, he is, he's doing, he, he, he's, he's, he's trying to say, hey, I, I'm going to say something to you. But before I say this, let me first talk about the majesty of God. I'm preparing you for what I'm about to say by saying about the majesty of God, right? We often tend to do that as well. We often tend to, if we're about to say something, usually it's in the context of bad news. We try to say, we try to say, mom, I, I, okay, let me tell you, we were playing and, and, and it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, my brother and my sister, we were playing and we cleaned the house. We did everything. We did all of this. We prepared, we cooked food for you. We, we folded our clothes. We did all of this. But we also kind of broke the coffee table, right? We, all, we tend, to, tend to say something like that, right? So that's what I believe Paul is doing here. He talks about the majesty of God, and then he starts off to say, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, he starts begging with us, begging with the church. I plead with you. I beseech you. In view of God's mercy, 
in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. What I want to talk to us today is presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice. That's a little bit of a scary thing. And it's understandable that Paul would say, first, let me tell you about the majesty of God, the greatness of our God, and then I'm going to tell you about presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice, right? We all know sacrifices. We all know that there's sacrifice in the Old Testament. But what is the difference between, an old, uh, between a dead and a living sacrifice? Can anybody tell me? Wait, what would you say? One is a lot. Okay, perfect. Well, it wasn't a trick question. Sometimes the simplest answer is the right answer. One is alive, right? So what happens when you take a dead sacrifice and you put it at the altar? What's that? No. Someone said something. No feeling. Someone said Pain, no pain, no feeling, right? You take a dead sacrifice and you put it at the altar. There's no feeling. There's no, there's no, there's no pain. On the reverse, has anyone here ever burnt their hand? How many of, well, I, how many of the, yeah, thank you. How many of you have tried to straighten your hair and, you know, Alan, you, I know, I knew you were going to say something, so I looked at you. You burnt your hand or your neck or something while straightening. What happens when, when there's fire under you? The first instant reaction for us is to move away from it. Right? The first instant reaction is when we, are, when we put our hands on fire is to move away from it. Yet Paul here is asking us to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. What happens to a living organism that is being sacrificed? When you put that on the fire, what is, when we, when, like he's asking us to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, what happens to us? What is our instantaneous reaction? Okay, y'all are whispering. Speak it up. I, I, I can't either, I can't hear y'all or it's through the mask, it's not coming clear. To pull away. When we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, the instantaneous reaction is to pull away. God, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do this. I'm going to, I'm going to submit myself for, for ministry. I'm gonna do this. And immediately the Holy Spirit says, Well, I need you to quit your job. Did I say full-time ministry? God, what I really meant was. Right? And then when we are finally ready, maybe we might come back. God, you know what? As soon as I get this job, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to write off my entire first paycheck to the church. And then when we get that first paycheck, what happens is there's ice and snow and our car slides into a mailbox. And now we've got a whole bunch of repairs. Ooh. Ooh. God, I'll give you my second paycheck. I, I promise, I'll, I'll, give, I'll make it up. I'll give you my second paycheck plus interest. I'll give you an extra $50. What happens to a living sacrifice when you put it on the altar, when you put it on fire, is its instant reaction is to pull away. And that is why Paul is telling us to offer your bodies. To offer it up. For us to make our bodies as a living sacrifice. That's not something that happens because Pastor Shibu told you to. That's not something that happens because uh, uh, Jitu told you, hey, this is what I need you to do. Because if it's something that Pastor Shibu told you, hey, this is what I need you to do, the moment the fire is turned on, we'll immediately take it away. But Scripture tells us, I need you to offer it. It has to be your choice, your decision. It has to come from your heart and your mind. It has to come from, 
It has to come from inside of us. See, because if Pastor Shibu makes this decision for us and tells us, church, starting next week, every single one of us is not even, it's, we're not going to just do 10%. We're going to do 15% of our, of, our, uh, of our income. We're going to give 15%. Some of us will do it. We might do it for a month. We might do it for two months. We might do it for three months. But when that big bill comes in, when that renovation starts to happen, when, there's, when, when your car stops working, that 15 slowly starts to become 12, then becomes 11, then becomes 10, and if we're bold, maybe 8. But when we make that decision, when we make that decision to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, no matter how hot that fire is, we know why we made that decision, so we choose to stay on that altar. We choose to stay on that altar. See, I told you about, I told you about offering up your first paycheck. It's not something that everyone has to do, or it's not scriptural, it's nothing. But I say that because when I first came to America and, uh, you know, I started working at CVS and then I started working at the apartment complex. And I remember when I got my new job, I took my first paycheck to church. I took it to pastor and I said, pastor, I want to give my first entire paycheck to the church. And shortly after, in the ice, my car slid. I didn't hit a, a, a mailbox, but I hit another car. As a college student, with my, my parents weren't here. The only financial support that I really had was my own paycheck. And guess what? I had just given this paycheck to the church. And I remember my pastor even coming up to me and saying, Danny, I can give this back to you. Once you get back on your feet, you can give it, bring it back to the church. And for a split second in my mind, in my, in my mind, I was like, Maybe I should consider that. But immediately the Holy Spirit said, you made a decision. No one asked you to do that. You made a decision to be a living sacrifice. Don't take your hand back away. It was the toughest. It was one of the toughest decisions for me to make. Because as a college student, when I made that decision, I had only $7 in my bank account. I said, Pastor, you know what? I'm going to trust you. I'm, I'm going to trust God. I made this de decision. I'm going to give it. And as I gave it, and, and, and you know, uh, Pastor David Richard, most of you know him. He's, he's very good with vehicles, very good with cars. He looked at me, and I asked him, how much, would you, how much do you think I'll get back from insurance? He looked at me, and he said, Danny, you'll get about two cheeseburgers. That's about how much this car is worth right now. But let me tell you something. My God is my God. My God is greater than anything else. When I took it back to the insurance, not only did they pay off my car, not only did they cover the cost, they gave me enough to buy another vehicle. And I'm not saying this as a prosperity message. No, I'm not saying any. What I'm trying to say is, Scripture is asking us, you choose to make yourself as a living sacrifice. And when you do that, that becomes holy and pleasing to God. And scripture tells us that this is our true and proper worship. What time are we ending? Okay, okay. Perfect, because I'm almost done. This is your true and reasonable worship. This is your true act of service. It go, there, there's several different versions, right? But some of you, if you've studied Greek, what you will know is that the Greek translation of that word there, reasonable, is the word logikos. And this word logikos is where we get our English word logical. This is your logical act of worship. See, what, 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 what Paul is trying to say is, Danny, 
your logical act of worship, the only thing that makes sense is you offering up your life as a living sacrifice. The only thing that makes sense, and that's why Paul started off by saying, therefore, because let me tell you something, when you look at how majestic our God is, who has ever given to God that God should repay them? Who has ever given to God that God should? God is not a debtor to anybody. He is not a debtor to anyone. Scripture also tells us, Romans chapter 5, verse 8, that he loved us in spite of our sin. For a God that loves you and me in spite of what we do, a God that is so majestic, who, a God that has loved us beyond anything else, the only logical the only logical answer, the only logical thing that we can do, the only appropriate response that we can bring to our God, our worship, our commitment, our service, the only logical thing is for us to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice before God. Anything else, anything short of offering yourself as a living sacrifice is illogical. Anything short of that just doesn't make sense. What scripture is telling us here is that if you are not offering yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, if you are not offering your bodies as a living sacrifice, if you are not offering your worship and in its entirety to God, that's illogical. That's insane. That's mad. That's, that's completely just out of this world. I don't even want to think about it. Our logical, the only thing that makes sense, our reasonable act of worship. In fact, let me put it this way. The bare minimum the bare minimum that is required of us is to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. The bare minimum. If you're in church, if you're serving, if you're doing above and beyond that, I praise God for you. But if this evening, if we're not even doing the bare minimum, the bare minimum, we need to really reevaluate our lives. God gives us a bare minimum for a reason. When they created, were you, any engineers here? Okay, one. Well, you don't have to be an engineer to understand this. But anything that is made like this or this chair, when they create something for a purpose, there's a bare minimum that's given to it, to every object, right? There's a bare minimum. What is the bare minimum that this can hold? Just for it to function, there needs a bare minimum. If it cannot even do that bare minimum, the moment I sit on this chair, it's going to fall. The moment I put my Bible on this platform, if it's not built to even the bare minimum standards, it's just going to fall over. You see where I'm going with this? If we as Christians, if we as believers, if we as children of God do not do the bare minimum, we'll crumble and fall the moment anything comes our way. Church, if we can't do the bare minimum, there's really something that we really need to reevaluate, really need to look into our lives. In that, uh, what was the first song that we sang? Build My Life. In that, there's a line that talks about take, showing the people around us. If our bare minimum is not even showing the people around us, are we even doing the bare minimum?
this evening, if there's anything that you take away from this, is I want us to ask God, ask ourselves, ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, am I even doing the bare minimum? Am I even doing the bare minimum? Because I know if we ask ourselves, am I offering myself as a living sacrifice, we get scared about that. Because it sounds like such a big commitment. But rephrase that and say, Holy Spirit, am I even doing the bare minimum? If I'm not, I really need your help. I really need your help. Because without the Holy Spirit, none of us can do it. Without the Holy Spirit, none of us can even meet that bare minimum requirement of offering ourselves as a living sacrifice. It goes on to say, holy and pleasing to God. Holy and acceptable to God. All eyes closed in this place. Jesus, we worship you. God, as I offer myself as a living sacrifice to you, is it a sweet-smelling offering to you, O oh God? Is it a sweet-smelling offering to you, O oh God? Holy Spirit, I ask that I'm able to see my life not through my lens, but as you say in your word, by the, by, in view of the mercies of the living God, that I would see my life in your view, by, the, by your mercy, O oh God. And when I do so, when I see how you are, what you have done, when I see you, Abba Father, that my life will be in response to you, a worship, a sweet-smelling offering, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you, God. Father, we give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray.